Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Austin Peterson here, former presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. Today is Wednesday, March the 29th, 2017. And today we're going to be talking about a very hot topic, the question of abortion in the context of the political movement, the alt-right. But before we do, a word from our sponsors. A big thank you to my sponsor, Podbean. I use Podbean's hosting services for the Freedom Report podcast, and let me just tell you, it's been absolutely great. It's a wonderful home for this podcast. If you're considering starting your own podcast, Podbean offers an easy-to-use platform with all the tools you'll need. Now they make it even easier with the ability to record podcasts on the go with their podcast app. Record and publish right from your phone. If you want to give Podbean a try, go to podbean.com slash freedom and you'll get one month free. That's podbean.com slash freedom. And we're back. Thanks very much for tuning into the show this morning, the Freedom Report podcast. Uh, an article came across my desk yesterday that I found very interesting uh, having to do with Richard Spencer and the alt-right. And uh, I don't really enjoy talking too much about this topic, but because I think it has to do uh, with such an important issue and because of the fact that the conservative and libertarian movements right now are going through what I would call an identity crisis, uh, and you see so many people going off in different directions, exploring uh, different philosophies, uh, different branches of conservative philosophy, different branches of libertarian philosophy. You've seen many conservatives uh, go off the rails recently and join uh, different movements. Some might, be, might call them quasi-fascist movements, and even libertarians have been tempted uh, by the political success of the alt-right movement. Um, I, I like to, uh, to address things that have a modern political context, especially when it comes to uh, such a big issue as abortion, which is obviously very controversial, very divisive. But, um, you know, you, my listeners who are, are familiar with me know that, you know, I went through uh, something of a transformation myself on this topic, uh, where I think for years I had considered myself to be uh, pro-choice. I underwent a change, a change in my thinking on this issue, and, and considered myself pro-life starting around four or five years ago. You know, it wasn't it wasn't just because of some sort of expediency. It was it was really a, a philosophical change. And this this issue has come up recently and, and been a big deal in conservative and libertarian circles for different reasons. Uh, the conservative circles because of what has occurred with the uh, former Blaze commentator Tommy Laren who was recently let go from the blaze. And, and most people are saying that Glenn Beck, who is the owner of the blaze, had let her go simply because of a di disagreement over the abortion issue, which, which I, I don't think is actually the case. I think it probably had a lot to do um, more with not professional jealousy, which some people are trying to accuse Beck of, but of the fact that, that uh, she didn't hew to any sort of uh, c consistency in, in her views. Uh, that she was sort of behaving like a stereotypical pundit on so many networks where she was probably just saying whatever she thought would get her the most amount of views and bring her the most amount of stardom, uh, which to me is problematic because, of course, if you're going to have someone who works for you and for your network, you don't want to feel like you're misleading viewers or, or giving someone um, viewpoints from someone who doesn't maintain any sort of uh, intellectual rigor or consistency. And, and that really is a, is a sincere problem. Not to, not to mention that, I mean, there have been rumors, again, these are unsubstantiated rumors, but we have gotten them from secondhand sources at The Blaze that she was just a nightmare to work with, an absolute terror, and there was a lot of friction there. So we don't really know exactly the full reasons why Tommy Laren was let go, but most people speculate that the, the fact that, not that she came out as pro-choice on The View, um, but the fact that just three weeks earlier she had been referring to people as baby killers and it wasn't as if she had so, some sort of uh, epiphany that she, that she unloaded on us during the View interview. It just seemed like she was being a bald opportunist in a sense. Uh, and, of course, Tommy Lahren's uh, public – I guess I can't call it a firing because it, it seems as if she was just benched and now the – from what I'm getting from reporting at TMZ, I know, I know you're going to say fake news, fake news, but from what I'm getting on the reporting is that she asked, actually asked to be let out of her contract, and they're currently in negotiations to find a, a peaceful settlement for her to leave. Uh, but, of course, many people loving Tommy Lahren have leaped to her defense, um, and uh, some people are even saying, well, no, you, 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 know, you can be a conservative and be pro-choice. or pre be pro -choice which I vehemently disagree with. Now, you may, you may be a libertarian and, and disagree when it comes to the life issue, and, and I acknowledge that out of, um, out of 
uh, respect to you know probably about half of the people in in my own movement, the libertarian movement. But in the conservative movement, I would say uniformly that the position is to be pro-life. But we're not really talking about the conservative movement when we're discussing the alt-right. We're discussing something that is, I think, I, I would call it alien to the conservative movement, even though those who run in the alt-right circles do tend to show up to conservative events. I mean, they don't go to left-wing events because they know they're going get, to get their face punched by Antifa. Uh, but when it comes to the the alt right, I, I see them as something new, but also rooted in something old—a very old uh, concept that had been around since the beginning of the modern progressive era. Because for those of you who don't know their history, of course, the progressive era, the progressive movement has always had a very eugenics, eugenicist sort of flair to it. Um, and we'll discuss Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood and all that stuff later. Again, these are controversial topics, and, and believe me when I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that, that I do my very best to remain as objective as I can. You know, and while letting you know what my biases are, I, I certainly have my biases. But I always want to be fair and try and give you as an uh, objective a view as I can on these issues so that you can be as informed as possible and make your own decisions because I, I don't just want everybody to agree with me because I think that that would, that the sort of inbreeding, <laughs> the intellectual inbreeding is, is what leads to movements collapses, right? So, so no, we don't always have to march in lockstep on issues. Like I say, I, I understand that there is a debate when it comes to abortion. I just happen to come down on the side of life for what I believe is my own intellectual consistency. Um, but when it comes to the alt-right, the alt-right is not pro-life, and uh, there's a very good reason for that, and an article that I found on a website called The Bridgehead This Morning details it when you understand the, the conception for why the alt-right is not pro-life. I think you'll understand a little bit more why people fling pejoratives like Nazis at um, the alt-right, why, uh, why people say you know, that uh, the alt-right is, is fascist in many ways. And, it, and abortion, I think, really comes down is the issue which lays it bare. If not for the fact that if you consider Richard Spencer, I mean, has been consistently in favor of universal health care provided by the government. Now, that would surprise you, right? Some people have even come out and say, said that the alt-right is, is not a right-wing movement, but it's a left-wing movement. And the reason why they say that is specifically because many people in the alt-right uh, people like Richard Spencer say that they think that the government should provide universal health care. And that is related to the abortion topic. But the reason, of course, why the alt-right people like Richard Spencer want the government to control health care is because they want to control who gets health care. And when you look at why uh, people like Bernie Sanders and uh, socialist Dems and you know social Democrats, why they say that they want people to have universal health care, I would say that Probably the, a, a majority of them want it because they, they believe that it would be good for everyone. They, they, they think that the government has the capability uh, to take care of everyone and that even if they can't, we should try. Uh, and it, it, they're sort of do-gooders, right? They're, they're, they're try, they're, essentially, they're called, we call them sometimes humanitarians with guillotines, right? That they, they want to come and they want to do good, and if you won't let them do good, well, then they're going to chop your head off. But when it comes to the alt-right, when it comes to the fascist movements, their position on universal health care isn't because they want to do good for everyone. It's because they want to do good for just white people, right? They, they just want to help the people of their race, right? They just want to have the government come in and take care of their race. And, and this way, they, if they control who can get health care, then they can ensure that some people might not get health care. Now, there may be a few communists, there may be a few social democrats who want the same thing, right? They want to have universal health care because they want to practice eugenics against conservatives, or maybe they hate the white race, so they want to use uh, eugenics against the white race, right? right? Th these, are, these are very fringe topics, so it's, it's very difficult to speak about them in, in generalizations. But it, it being as objective as I can, I would say that when it comes to the issue of universal health care, related to the alt-right and related to the social dems when you compare them it's for it's they want the same thing but for different reasons now i'm going to read this article to you by jonathan van maren at the bridgehead about richard spencer's abortion rants and then let's just discuss it for a few minutes about why i think um that the alt-right is not a conservative movement certainly not a libertarian movement and how it relates to modern politics 
And again, I'm reading this jo- this quote from Jonathan, or excuse me, I'm reading this article from Jonathan Marin. He quotes Richard Spencer in it, so I'll, I'll have to delineate between the two. And even though I'm reading it, it's sort in, you know, in first person, these aren't my viewpoints. So this is actually the conservative opinion when it comes to abortion and all that. So I'll try and make a difference between when you hear me saying I or my, that's usually, that's going to be the author. So I'll try my best to delineate so that you're not um, as confused, so we don't get confused. For those of you wondering why I'm writing another column about the alt-right, the reason is simple. Every time I do, people comment to explain why I'm wrong. Those people, some of whom I used to know, are starting to buy what the alt-right is peddling. Some of them are brazen enough to inform me that I, as an active social conservative, should be smart enough to realize that the Jews, whom they somehow believe to be a homogenous and monolithic group, are responsible for all of the evils Western civilization faces. One of these people even wrote that Richard Spencer had, quote, opened his eyes. For those of you who are fortunate enough not to have heard of him, Richard Spencer is the neo-Nazi who runs altright.com and has been attempting to hijack the conservative movement by cheerleading Donald Trump while promoting the same weird racial theories that gave rise to the Third Reich. He showed up uninvited at the Conservative Political Action Conference, palled around with Milo Yiannopoulos before Milo's comments excusing man-boy sexual relationships, which were apparently too much even for him, and, re- and recently released a video bemoaning the treatment of the Blazes' Tommy Laren, the supposedly courageous commentator who conveniently chose The View to do an about-face on abortion. In the video, Spencer mused that Laren might be the alt-right's hope, since many conservatives have turned on her over the abortion issue, and he couldn't help but point out she was blonde. Spencer then launched into a monologue on abortion, which should forever silence those conservatives who feel the bizarre temptation to flirt with the alt-right and smash the asinine idea that any compatibility exists between these two ideologies. This is Richard Spencer's quote. Quote, I think that some people who are in the alt-right want to believe that the anti-abortion crusade is just inherently traditionalist, that it is about making women take responsibility for their children, that it's going to make women become mothers whether they like it or not. I'm a bit skeptical of this view that abortion would have inherently traditionalist consequences. I think when we think about abortion, we often think about these careerist women who otherwise would be part of families, but are instead having abortion out of pure selfishness and greed. The fact is that it isn't like that. Those highly intelligent career women will have abortions on occasion, but to be honest, they're using contraception and they're avoiding pregnancy is what they're doing. The people who are having abortions are generally very often black or Hispanic or people from very poor circumstances, to be honest. End quote. Moving back to the author's perspective, he says, in case you missed it, Spencer can't be opposed to abortion in all circumstances because, because he quite likes the idea that a lot of African Americans and Hispanics are having abortions. This is a common idea on the alt-right. Alamer Fisher wrote a long column warning his fellow alt-writers against succumbing to the, quote, pro-life temptation for precisely this reason. It's not families we care about, he warned. It's white families. Back to Spencer, quote, And so the anti-abortion crusade becomes this human rights crusade. And if you look at the writing of people like Ramesh Ponaru of National Review, it is directly associated with this that every being that is a human has a right to life, and so on. Well, that's not how we think as identitarians, to be honest. You are part of a community. You're part of a family. You're part of a collective. You do not have some human right, some abstract thing given to you by God or by the world or something like that. You're part of a community, and that's where you gain your meaning or your rights. The anti-abortion crusade is often associated with family, the traditional family. But to be honest, it's descended into not just a human rights dogma, but but a kind of dysgenic quote, we are the world dogma, end quote. That's the end of Richard Spencer's. So th- so that should be the end of, and this is my point of view, not the author, that should be the end of any bo- false belief that the alt-right has anything to do with conservatism whatsoever at all in any way, shape, or form. Certainly they have absolutely nothing to do with libertarianism. And, you know, without getting too much on topic, uh, off topic, I think that the, the issue really has been just one of the fad that, that too many of the people who get caught up in the alt-right are doing so for purposes of the fads. There's a lot of young people who get attracted to it because of the memes and because of the jokes online and because, you know, they want to be, get excited about a new president. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, when I was at CPAC, I saw this poor kid who got caught up um, in the 
a wave of alt-right excitement, right? And what had happened was that he was standing next to Richard Spencer. He didn't know who Richard Spencer was. He was just a part of a of what he thought was a meme club, right? And this is often how it happens, how young, impressionable kids will get pulled into fringe political movements and, and get them into trouble, including, you know, Antifa and, and you know, the, the control left. But this poor kid was mooning over Richard Spencer. He was so excited to meet Richard Spencer because he didn't know what Richard Spencer was all about. Well, you know, when he was getting excited about talking to Richard and saying, oh, I support you, Richard, and, getting, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, the press, the international press was surrounding him right there at CPAC. And the international press started asking this other poor kid all these questions and saying, why are you a racist kid, blah, 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 blah. And the kid had no idea, right? He appeared in Slate magazine, and, and they, they smeared him, of course, because the left isn't going to adhere to any standards of objectivism or, or objective journalism or anything like that. They're just there to, to smear people. Like, the, what was the, the prank that they played handing out the Russian flags, right? They, they create the news. They create the fake news uh, in order to advance their agenda. And, you know, this poor kid got sw sideswiped. And he, he had no idea that the alt-right was about this kind of racism. And, you know, we saw him later at, at my booth at Stonegate. And, you know, he was really upset. His mom called him. People were freaking out because he was being, you know, push, put, put aside as a racist. Well, he just didn't know that the alt-right believed these things. All right, let me get back to the article. The, the author writes, If it weren't all so grotesque, it might actually be funny that hardcore far-right kids are getting sucked into the alt-right. Consider that, considering that Spencer's trash theory simply replaces Marx's utopian collective with a racial collective, damn straight. Communists gave us the gulag, and fascists gave us concentration camps with plenty of overlap. Richard Spen Spencer has handily highlighted one of the most overlooked aspects of alt-right ideology. In their view, you have no rights. Human rights don't exist. God doesn't either, for that matter. Dysgenic, by the way, refers to promulgating undesirable traits by allowing lesser specimens to reproduce. In, in case you weren't clear on what Spencer's opinion of non-white people was, Spencer goes on, quote, The most popular propaganda line for the pro-life movement is about, quote, black genocide, how this is destroying black communities, and in, indeed is a racist plot by Margaret Sanger, and so on. She was the founder of Planned Parenthood. This gets to something uh, that I think is a bigger point, and that is the alt-right or identitarians. We can't think about these issues in a kind of good or evil binary. We actually have to think about an issue like abortion in a complicated manner, something that this issue deserves. Lothrop Stoddard talked about contraception, not so much abortion, but contraception as a potentially world-changing for the good technology, or something that could change the world for the worse. In a way, he was absolutely right, and I think contraception has, to a large degree, changed the world for the worse. Again, this is Richard Spencer's view. Intelligent people will engage in family planning because they naturally have long time horizons. They think ahead. They aren't just going to run and have sex with someone without a condom and get them pregnant and so on. In a way, contraception has been terribly dysgenic in the sense that it is the only the smart people that really use it. Smart people are not using abortion as birth control. Smart people are using abortion when you have a situation like Down syndrome or you have a situation where the health of the mother is at risk. I would say that that is the unintelligent in blacks and Hispanics who use abortion as birth control, as a kind of late-term birth, birth control. And that is um, uh, Richard Spencer's point of view, by the way. If you're, if you're just hopping into this podcast from somewhere else, <laughs> these are not my viewpoints, FYI. Although I am sure that people will probably grab audio from this and try and smear me and, and attack me as if I was saying this, even though I'm saying the opposite. Uh, <laughs> or I believe the opposite. I'm not a fascist. Anyways. Lothrop Stoddard, in case you were wondering, is a long-dead eugenicist. This is the author, James Marinan. Uh, Stoddard is a long-dead eugenicist and Klansman who felt that colored people posed a danger to white civilization and is now resurrected so that neo-Nazis like Spencer can fangirl him. That's funny. When Spencer does have a problem with abortion, as with contraception, it's only because the wrong people are using it. White people, apparently, are so smart they're not replacing their own population, which is a great concern to those obsessed with the promulgation of certain pigmentations. Spencer warns that this is doing great harm to the white race. Quote, Richard Spencer says, We need to recognize this potential for both good and evil, or good and bad, within contraception itself. That this is something that can be a great boon for our people, for our race. It can be a great detriment. Contraception has been a great detriment because precisely the people who shouldn't be using it are using it. We want smart people to have more children. I sometimes want smart people to be a little more reckless. Don't plan. Don't use a condom. 
What I'm saying basically is the abortion issue is just a much more complicated issue than this good or evil binary that the pro-life movement and the Christian movement want to use. We need to be more adult than they are, end quote. And uh, James Marinan writes, I just want to point out for the second time that the alt-right is incompatible with Christianity. You don't even have to take my word for it. Take Spencer's. He finishes off his little rant with a welcome repudiation of the pro-life movement. Richard Spencer, quote, we should recognize that the pro-life movement, this is not the alt-right. This has nothing in common with identitarians. And I think we should be genuinely suspicious of people who think in terms of human rights and who are interested in adopting children and bring them to the country who get caught up in this issue. We want to be a movement about families, about life in a deep sense, not just rights, but truly great life and greatness and beautiful, flourishing, productive families. We want to be eugenic in the deepest sense of the word. Pro-lifers want to be radically dysgenic, egalitarian, multiracial human rights thumpers, and they're not us. End quote. And this is the author, James Marin, and not my point of view, but he's, uh, James says, amen to that. We most certainly are not. Spencer's little rant is valuable because it is brutally honest. Those who adopt children of a different race are race traitors. Those who believe in human rights cannot be part of the alt-right because some humans will have to be sacrificed for the good of the white collective. And just as in Nazi Germany, not even all white children will be safe because the alt-right believes in eugenics. As Spencer mentioned earlier, smart people abort children with Down syndrome. What Spencer has just described here is basically the Nazi idea of an Aryan super race. It's hard to accuse someone of being a Nazi when they own the title so thoroughly. I hope this reveals yet again why conservatives can find no common ground with the alt-right. I hope this explains why I find it so reprehensible and disgusting that commentators like Gavin McInnes are willing to give Richard Spencer a platform, and multiple times, too. Conservatism is going through a time of upheaval, and we have to be extraordinarily vigilant. The alt-right is attempting to infiltrate the mainstream, using people like McInnes and Milo and others. And if they manage to do it, conservatism is going to need chemotherapy. Wow. Very good article by Jonathan Van Maren at the Bridgehead. Dot ca terrific article and um you know what i see what's happening in the conservative mo movement right now is very much mirroring what's happening in the libertarian movement i think what is happening so is that so many people who had been so tired of losing for so long were, were desperate for for to be a part of anything that they thought could actually defeat their enemies i mean if you think about it the uh, so f so often um, people don't want to vote for a person. They want to vote. They're voting. F well, they want to vote for so for a person, but they don't have an option to. They usually are choosing between lesser of two evils or lesser of three evils, and then and then what they are voting is they're trying to vote to stop uh, the the greatest evil. Right when it came to defeating Hillary Clinton, people voted for Donald Trump probably not because they they really liked Donald Trump so much, but because they really wanted to stop Hillary. And, you know, quite frankly, quite frequently, we do this in, in the United States because of the way that we vote and because of our unwillingness to consider third parties, because the way that the system is rigged against third parties very often. Um, and you get these sorts of extreme binary viewpoints or you get these extreme binary characters between candidates where, you know, if, if you really just want to try and stop someone else, well, then you're going to vote for another guy and, you know, you're going to have to deal with all the bad that you have to deal with in that. Now, I'm not saying that, that Donald Trump is, is um, you know, is a member of the alt-right or anything like that. I think Donald Trump is, is probably a lot more socially liberal than most people even realize, you know, and he's lived in New York City his entire life. So I think it's kind of a mischaracterization to put all Donald Trump in, in, in the bag with these guys. I think that some of the stuff that he says is definitely stupid, and it's probably racist just by by default. But in meaning that he's he's probably not necessarily meaning for it to be. But I think that the reason why he stumbles in in saying some of those things is is probably because he's trying to say what he thinks the audience wants to hear. Um, and this brings me to another point that I wanted to make. And I, as I've actually thought of this as I was nodding off to sleep last night. Um, but I think that the problem lies with the fact that. If you think about what's happening with the media, for example, like Tommy Lahren, out, right? The Judge Napolitano I saw is back today on Fox. That's terrific news. Um, but the what's happening with the media is it's so easy to blame the media for our problems. And the reason why it's, it, people love to blame the media for our problems is because it's easy. It's so easy to blame the media for our problems. It's so much easier to blame the media and say, well, we, get, we have these bad politicians because the media props them up. Well, in some sense, you have a point. But the problem with this is, is that the truth is usually much more difficult for people to accept. 
The truth is, is that we get bad media. We get cash me outside girl. We get stupid reality shows. We get that because we demand it because there's a market for it. Right. And so there's a market for bad politics too. But the truth is, is that we want to blame the politicians, but it's we, the people that are putting these people into office. We, the people who are giving these people credibility, we, the people are demanding the type of media and the politics that we get because we vote for it. Right. We vote for it. We vote with, for media with our dollars and with our views. And we vote for politicians with our actual votes. And and um, and that's the thing is that the, the people do not want to look at themselves and say, maybe we're the problem. Maybe we need to stop consuming this kind of media. Maybe we need to do it. You know why? Because we Amer human nature is always to be attracted to the lewd, to the lascivious and to shy away from the virtuous. Well, why? Because the lewd, the lascivious, these are our base instincts. These are our lizard brains, right? This is the id. And we love to watch people, other people, like the schadenfreude of watching, you know, a 14-year-old, you know, hood rat um, go, bur go down in burning flames on television. That, that's entertainment to us. Whereas, you know, sitting around watching a lecture for an hour, hour and a half on human rights is not the kind of thing that's going to get a million billion views on, on YouTube or on Facebook. And, and it, it, of course, it, it's disheartening to someone like myself because, you know, I, I, over the last three years that I've been working for myself, trying to spread libertarian ideas through this website, through this podcast, it's been disheartening to me because, you know, you see so many people who just fly up out of nowhere overnight. And, and it's because of the tactics that they use, saying, saying wild things, saying nutty things, changing their viewpoints here or there just to try and fit in with the crowd or to say whatever is, is popular. And it, it's really challenging for me because, you know, I want to be relevant. I want to be popular. But what I don't want to do is sell my soul to get there, right? I, and I say that as an agnostic, but uh, you, you know what I'm saying. But when it comes to the media, you cannot blame the media for bad politics. And the American people want to blame the media. It's popular when Donald Trump pokes fun at the newspapers, calls them fake news. People online and like, you know, the Tommy Lahren fan club are like, oh, this news that we don't like, we, we disagree with is fake news. Right. Because people just want the saccharine bald faced lies. They want the, the sweet lies. They don't want the hard truth. The hard truth is, is that the, we get the media that we demand. Uh, that's because we create a market for it. So if you don't like the media, if you don't like the politicians, stop watching and stop voting for them. Thank you very much for listening to the Freedom Report podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Very exciting. Coming up this weekend, I'll be heading to Philadelphia. I'm going to Swarthmore College first and then the Mid-Atlantic Liberty Festival. If you guys are interested in seeing me, I'm coming to a town near you. I'll be in Los Angeles um, the week after that, so that's really cool. I'm going to be on the Dave Rubin Report. Pretty exciting. He's a, he's a former liberal, now-leaning libertarian, and he's been doing a lot of really interesting interviews with people like Glenn Beck, and he has graciously invited me to come on his show. So I will be doing that. And then the day after that, if you're in Los Angeles, I think I'm going to be speaking at Cal State Fullerton. So if you'd like to come out and see me, just check the events calendar on my Facebook page. So if you're listening to this later, facebook.com slash producer Peterson, you can see my entire event schedule. I'm all over the place, man. I'm, I'm going to be speaking at the University of Iowa. Uh, that's on April 11th. Then I'm speaking at a gun show on April 15th in Carthage, Missouri, my home state of Carthage, Missouri. I'll be speaking at um, the Liberty Tree Gun Store. Uh, after that, I'll be at Mercer College in Georgia. I'm going to be speaking at, excuse me, Mercer University. Um, uh, the, uh, the School of Law has invited me to come and speak, which I am just beyond honored. So, that, you know, maybe there is some good coming out of all this after all. Um, a big opportunity to speak there, as well as a week in Australia, where I'll be spreading libertarian ideas to the Aussies down under. Very excited. And um, after that, well, you all know some big news is coming up first week of June. So keep an eye on me, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we'll continue the good fight for liberty. Have a fantastic day.